Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. This show is available on Apple, Google, Spotify, Edify, Liftable, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to go review the show so more people can find out about it because this is the show where I interview major thought leaders who show that worldview changes everything. My guest for today's podcast is professor and philosopher, Dr. Frank Beckwith. Dr. Beckwith is professor of philosophy and church state studies at Baylor University. He teaches undergraduate students, graduate students, doctoral students, and has been published in all kinds of places. This is a, he's a major uh, writer of academic articles and books. Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, the Journal of Medical Ethics, the Journal of Social Philosophy. He's also written a number of books on all kinds of issues from law to politics to pro-life. And in our conversation, we're going to talk about Dr. Beckwith's responses to the Dobbs decision and some of the work that he did to help make good arguments for pro-life viewpoints in his book, Defending Life. Please welcome Dr. Frank Beckwith to the show. Dr. Frank Beckwith, welcome to the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, you've been one of my favorite philosophers. And you are also a professor at Baylor University. I got my master's degree at Baylor University, so mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm a Baylor grad, sick and bears. <laughs> and uh, you've taught there now how many, how many years? This, let's see, in beginning in fall of 2022, it'll be my 20th year at 20th Baylor. 20th year. So in 20 years, so your, your older students now are going to be in their early 40s. Yeah. <laughs> and they've got careers of their own. And the impact that you've been able to have through teaching in that program, it just seems extraordinary to me. It it is, I mean, I think uh, not so much about my undergrads, although I've had many undergrads, some of whom have gone on to have great careers, but we have a doctoral program in philosophy at Baylor. And the thing that I find just astonishing is how well our PhD graduates have done in terms of their placement, where they're at in terms of their professional uh, status and appointments. We've had philosophers who have left our program and have become department chairs, uh, university deans. I mean, it's it's so one of the things about Baylor, at least in terms of our graduate program, we have this sort of vision of placing our graduates in positions of leadership at Christian institutions. And so it's been a, it, that's, I think, one of the most gratifying things. You've got at, at Baylor, you've got a historically Baptist university. Mm-hmm. It's super famous now. Everybody wants to go there. <laughs> you know, all, all of the students I talk to yeah. all want to go to, they all want to go to Baylor. And, and it, as I think through the, when my, uh, my time there, I think my fellow graduate students and I had a worry that having gone to Baylor, would be a difficult, would be make our careers more difficult because it, because of its Baptist orientation. Sure. In fact, my undergraduate advisor, when I told him I was going to Baylor because I could go there, I could teach speech and coach the debate team and go for free. Yeah. As I was involved in the collegiate debate program, he said, Baylor is nothing but a neo fascist finishing school. Those were his exact. <laughs> oh, wow. Those were his exact words yeah. uh, about about the school, and I, I mean, we had different relationships with our professors in those days. You could yeah. talk back more and yeah. not get in, in trouble, and so I kind of talked back uh, at him a little bit. But I just, I just remember thinking, is this, is this the end of my career? But what you're telling me is these students are coming out of this program and they're really rising to the top. Yeah. Now I. The, uh, some of the other departments have done very well also, but I can only speak for, for philosophy. I think one of the things that, that I guess we didn't really expect, but, it, but it's worked out this way, that a lot of Christian institutions trust us in mm-hmm. terms of uh, the sort of graduates that we're putting out, people that are committed Christians, that they are looking to be affiliated with an institution that has a mission, but they also want to be really good scholars. And so we've been uh, very fortunate in having grad students come in who have 
published in the leading journals, who have received contracts from major publishers. And so we've developed this kind of interesting niche. Uh, our, stu our graduates mostly get hired at Christian institutions, but we've had some hired at secular institutions. Uh, not too long ago, we had, we've had a few at state institutions. We have two right now at Air Force Academy who okay. are on the faculty there. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. And we could probably talk Baylor all day. Yeah. <laughs> but I really wanted to, in the time that we have together, uh, talk about the Dobbs decision. Mm -hmm. Now, the a little bit of background for people who are watching or listening is, uh, Frank, you wrote a book many years ago called Defending Life. And it was, I hope I'm describing this accurately, because it's been a long time since I read it, but it was f formative for me yeah. in making public arguments that have a, a strong philosophical grounding defending life. Yeah, it was a, I published it in 2007 it, with the Cambridge University Press, which uh, was really important for my career with the, the, one of the two top presses is yes. our Oxford and Cambridge. Yeah. I was pleasantly surprised when, they, <laughs> when yeah. they sent me a contract and made me the offer. But the purpose of the book was to offer a sophisticated defense of the pro-life position that did not appeal to theology or scripture. Uh, I do think that you can make theological and scriptural of arguments. Course. I obviously have done that in other venues. But this book was really presenting to a more secular public this is why pro-lifers hold the views that they do. And so in the book, I present a kind of brief uh, analysis of why you can even argue about abortion. And then I talk about the legal cases. Uh, that time, there was obviously no Dobbs. It was Roe v. Wade and Casey v. Planned Parenthood. And then uh, for the remainder of the book, mostly dealing with philosophical arguments for abortion rights and making a case as to why they, they fail. Uh, and yeah. the book has done very well for an academic book. I think it's in its fifth printing. Wow. It is probably the most cited pro-life academic book in, in the literature. It's helped me get a lot of citations <laughs> on Google Scholar. <laughs> but uh, the other thing is that since Dobbs has come out, I've actually approached Cambridge about doing a revised edition and they've invited me to uh, make a uh, proposal. Yes. So I'm, I'm confident, although not, you know, nothing is, is for certain, but I'm, I'm confident given how well the book did before that if that they will allow me to do a second edition, which will yeah. deal with not only Dobbs, but there's been a lot of other things written since then. The climate in America has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, the level of discourse is not as polite as it was uh, 15 years ago. So there are going to be aspects of, of, uh, of my case that are going to be slightly different. And I'll have to also respond to critics. People have written uh, critical reviews of the book. Yes. Well, all of that is I think that's just fascinating. I'm so glad you have the opportunity to do that. I didn't know how to say this, but I think your your book has been extraordinarily influential in the way that people think about life philosophically, but also legally. When you and I first met, you, in fact, you were you just went to law school on top of having your doctorate in philosophy. You went to law school because that's you wanted to master the legal process or the legal arguments yes. and so forth. Yeah, 11 years after my PhD, my wife let me go to law school. I went to Wash U in St. Louis and earned a degree, which they no longer offer there anymore, called a Master of Juridical Studies, where I took most of the required curriculum. And then, but unlike a regular law degree, I had to write a dissertation. And yeah. it was basically an academic degree in law. And it's one of the at least in terms of professionally, it was one of the best decisions mm. I'd made because it opened up a lot of doors. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, when I talk to elected officials on any issue, the main question they ask me is, can you give me that argument without Bible verses? Yeah. Because I need to be able to make it to people who don't see the Bible as a source. Now that you can use the logic that flows from the Bible. Yeah. But if you start quoting scripture verses from what people are telling me, it makes your case weaker. 
Th and that's right. The public eye. That's right. I mean, you have to consider your audience. I mean, think about the model of St. Paul on Mars Hill. The Apostle Paul is preaching to an Athenian audience that is not Jewish. <laughs> right. They don't accept the Hebrew Scriptures. And so he says, I'm going to tell you about this temple, this unknown God that you have a temple to. And, and he, of course, he basically describes God as the creator, mm -hmm. right? And, and quotes then, from? That's right, from, the, the, from their poets. From right? Greek poets. That's right. Yeah. And now, but interestingly, earlier in the, the same uh, chapter, Acts ch chapter 17, Paul is in a synagogue. He doesn't have that strategy. He has a different strategy. Yes. And that tells us something about how Christians ought to interact, mm -hmm. right? If you're, if you're with people that don't share our uh, high view of Scripture, you're going to have to find other ways to, to speak to them. And I think Paul's the model. Yeah, yeah. Start with where people are. That's right. And then move them toward truth. Well, this is really, this is a lot of fun to have the opportunity to sort of process through the Dobbs case. Uh, ruling that the Roe v. Wade and uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey mm -hmm. decisions were wrongly decided, that they are unconstitutional, and that now we've got to take a different approach. Yeah. So you you've got you can't you can't use the courts to bypass Congress. Congress makes the laws, and yeah. if. And now each state is having to make all of these decisions. I'd love for you to just talk about, Frank, when you first heard, and we all sort of had a preview yeah. because this decision was leaked. Uh, but when you were in law school, it was about the time, when, when was that? That was 2000, 2001. Okay. It was so over 20 was years ago. It was about the time when Samuel Alito was being... Yeah, Alito, nominated. at that time, Alito was a federal appellate court judge, I believe in the Third Circuit. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, it was a couple of years later that George W. Bush yes. nominated him mm -hmm. and he was uh, confirmed. But yeah, so when I went to law school, I actually took a course called Reproductive Control Seminar, which was taught by a professor named Susan Appleton, who was very strongly pro-abortion. And uh, we went over, it was a course entirely on the, the abortion wow. cases. And she was actually a very good professor, even though she and I didn't agree. She was very fair-minded, and I will tell you, I got the highest grade in the class, <laughs> and I got an award for it, which was, you know, for me, I was just, I, I would really spoke well of her. I mean, she was, uh, yes. uh, but, uh, yeah, so when I went to law school, uh, I actually got to meet Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Mm. Uh, she visited... Uh, Wash U Law School, and I heard her speak, and I actually spoke to her for about five, ten minutes afterwards. And even though I didn't, don't agree with her judicial philosophy, it was an honor to be able to meet uh, a member of the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah. So, so way back then, yeah, is when some of these things were starting to be decided. Yeah, you know, Samuel Alito was on. He's written a lot of decisions. Yeah, but it been the lead author on a lot of decisions. Yeah. But would you say this is the most consequential oh. decision that he's... Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. By, by far. No matter who, have, who would have written it, it would have been yeah. the most consequential yeah. for, for their career. So what makes it so, I mean, amazing to me is that you have to go back to Roe v. Wade. So let go, if, let's go back to Roe. And, and why, was it con why was that controversial to begin with? Well, Justice Harry Blackman, who wrote the majority in Roe, had to, if he wanted to get a right to abortion found in the Constitution, he had to make a case for it. So how do you make a case for something that's actually not in the Constitution, right? So you read the Bill of Rights, there's nothing that explicitly says that there's a right to abortion, like there is a right to freedom of speech or religious free exercise. To do that, he has to say that there is, there are unenumerated rights. Now, what's an unenumerated right? Well, it's a right that's not written down. And, you know, I, I, you could have a right that's not written down. So, so for example, um, there are uh, assumptions that are made in the very existence of a legal regime. So imagine, for some strange reason, 
uh, the state of Colorado said, we're going to make marriage illegal. Right. <laughs> Even though there is no right to marriage in the Constitution, the Supreme Court, I think, would rightfully say, no, in order to have a human civilization, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, people have to have the right to join together and beget children and to create families. This is just part of what we presuppose as part of the infrastructure of our civilization and every civilization. So, so I, I, you know, I know a lot of uh, legal conservatives want to say there are no unenumerated rights. I think that's a mistake. I think that there are, okay, there are unenumerated and like that. That that and, and they're part of what our part of what what Alito calls our nation's traditions and history. Mm-hmm. So 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 what what Justice Blackman did in in Roe v. Wade, he said, well, there's this unenumerated right to abortion that's tied to another unenumerated right, the right of privacy. Well, where do they get that? Well, from a case called Griswold v. Connecticut, Mm -hmm. which said that there's a fundamental right to contraception. And so uh, the problem, though, with abortion is that unlike contraception, and, and, and in Griswold, the court tied it to the intimacy of married life. And you can sort of see that yeah, so there could be an unenumerated right to that. But here's the problem with abortion. There's a third party, mm. the fetus. Mm-hmm. It's not a right that's simply exercised in terms of a self-regarding act. It involves a being whose nature we share. Mm-hmm. So what does Blackman do? He says that w- the court is not going to decide whether, mm. you know, he says, well, experts disagree about when life begins. So the court at this point in the development of man's knowledge is not in, is not in a position to speculate. So he basically kicks the can down the road. He yeah. says that there is that we're not going to deal with this. And besides, uh, all the laws that prohibited abortion, because remember that when Roe v. was decided in 1973, if you just went back one decade to 63, every state in the United States prohibited abortion in some form or another. In fact, very few exceptions. Most, virtually all of them had life of the mother exceptions. But in the mid six, or mid-60s, or early 70s, states start decriminalizing abortion, but not everywhere. There mm-hmm. were maybe 12, 13 states that had, uh, you know, allowed for liberalization. But the, with the exception of New York and Colorado, virtually all of them were still quite conservative in, in, in what they permitted. So what does Blackman do to get, to get a right to abortion? He says, well, the anti-abortion laws that were in place for nearly 100 years in the U.S. were originally put in place to protect women from dangerous operations, not mm. to protect unborn mm. life. What we've learned since that decision in fact, he relied, and this is something Alito brings up in Dobbs. Black For like 15 pages. That's right. Yeah. So he, he points yeah. out, what Alito points out is that Blackman relied on two articles for the whole history of American abortion law. They were written by a lawyer named Cyril Means, who was, who was an attorney for the National Abortion Rights Action League. Mm-hmm. And so Alito points out in Dobbs that that entire grounding of the purpose of abortion laws was fabricated. That in fact, if you go back and look at the reasons why those laws were put in place, they were put there primarily to protect unborn life. And of course, also to protect women from, you know, illegal and dangerous uh, operations. But they, but they were primarily there to uh, defend and protect unborn human beings. And so part of the Dobbs opinion by Alito is to show that the entire grounding of Roe v. Wade was flawed, that the historical arguments were entirely fabrications. And most people who were scholars at the time knew that. And so much of what Alito relies on in terms of scholarship, a lot of us have known about for a long time. In fact, a lot of the scholars that Alito cites in his opinion, I cited in Defending Life 15 years ago. But I, I wasn't unique. I mean, there were lots of other people who did the same thing. So a lot of this is stuff that people have known about for quite some time. Yes. And 
it's probably a good idea because this is so consequential to for for people who are watching or listening to find that decision and read it yes and it's uh, depending on how you print it out it's 80 pages including all of the citations i guess yeah, and of course, legal opinion, the Supreme Court opinions, it's 80 pages, but the words are big. <laughs> so, so I tell it to my students. I teach, a, I teach several law class, con law classes at Baylor, uh, and I tell them when I said, you know, it says 75 pages, but it's really, you can really breeze through this. Yeah, uh, yeah. the words are big as in the type size is The type large, set, yeah, right? that's yeah, right. Yeah. Not, not length of words. There are some long words, but yeah. generally, yeah, typeset is pretty yeah. large. I think people will be uh, surprised at the fact that they can read it. And now we, we've had uh, on this show, we've had different people who've been involved in the pro-life movement, some of whose focus is caring for moms who are in, uh, in unplanned pregnancies, others who are more focused on the uh, debunking uh, abortion arguments. Hmm. But in the, in the time that we have, I wonder if, if we could just talk a little bit about what this likely means for the future of laws related to abortion in the United States. Because it, it, it yeah. seems like we're sort of moving from a nation where we're one of the most permissive, along with North Korea, China. Yeah. You know, not that I'm trying to be hyperbolic. That's literally the case. There are only a handful of nations with laws that were as liberal as ours now to where we're in the different states anyway you're going to be a little bit more aligned with what most other nations have yeah. in terms of their abortion law but I'd, l I'd love to just hear you speculate about that's right what so what roe v wade essentially did or excuse me not roe v wade dobbs essentially did was to say that there is no constitutional right to abortion but that doesn't mean that states can't have liberal laws as you, mm -hmm. as, you as you alluded to so what i think you're going to find different states are going to be all over the place. So states like California, New York, probably Colorado, uh, states that tend to be more blue rather than red uh, are going to have more liberal abortion laws. In fact, I think New York's most recent law, which they put in place anticipating Roe v. Wade being overturned, is actually more radical than Roe v. Wade. Wow. Uh, and I suspect that's the case in California, although I've not read read their statute. So, so what you'll have is fights in every state, debates in, in different states. Now, certain states like Texas, Mississippi, states that tend to be more red, you're going to probably have greater limitations on the right to abortion. Uh, interesting cases will be the, the, the more purple states, the ones that may have more liberal leadership, but the, uh, or divided leadership, but the, can, the state population is, let's say, more red, like maybe Pennsylvania. That's an interesting mm -hmm. case, right? So Pennsylvania, where you have people that uh, the state typically will vote, um, lean a little bit liberal, but generally on moral issues, the, uh, most of the state, excepting Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, tends to be more like Alabama. In fact, it reminds me of an old saying by... Uh, I think it was Jim Car James Carville who said that uh, I don't want to do I, I have to do a Carville impression. I'm not going to try it here. But Carville said said that, you know, I'll explain I'll explain Pen uh, Pennsylvania to you. It's uh, two New Yorks with an Alabama in between, you know, and that's. Yeah. So they're going to be states like that. Right. Yeah. Where 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 there are going to be really big debates and uh, it will probably involve some kind of compromise at the end of the day because mm -hmm. political officials will want to sort of move past the issue. And then you'll have cases like Michigan, which is a lot like Pennsylvania, where in this right now, we I think we have an attorney general and governor who are both very strongly pro-abortion. Uh, but there's a, a law that uh, that now because Roe v. Wade's been overturned, a law that's pre Roe v. Wade that r severely restricts abortion that they don't want to enforce. <laughs> right. Uh, but they probably don't have the numbers in the legislature to actually write a new law. So what they're doing, my understanding is the attorney general is, is actually going to the Supreme Court of, of Michigan, making the argument that the law actually is inconsistent with Michigan's constitution. 
the attorney general for Michigan. For Michigan. Yes. Wow. Okay. So, okay. you know, it's one of those things where there, there may be something in the Michigan Constitution that maybe has a vague right of privacy and she may want to argue, oh, that implies the right to abortion. Something like that was done actually in Kansas, mm -hmm. uh, I think about five or six years ago. Kansas, of all places, actually, their Supreme Court says that there's a Kansas constitutional right to abortion. And right now there's, in Kansas, I think a referendum to try to have a constitutional amendment to overturn that Kansas Supreme Court opinion. Yeah, yeah. So now, instead of having one national battle, so to speak, you've got 50 state battles. Talk to, you know, Colorado's a, this weird mix of libertarian and liberal. Yeah. So it's almost, it, it's, it wouldn't surprise anybody who's lived here for a while that Colorado was a battleground in the legalization of abortion to begin with. I think it was the first state to liberalize abortion, yeah. I think in 67. Yeah. Okay, so talk to people in states like Colorado or other states because you there, there's going to be a difference. Arkansas is going to have a different kind of battle. Kansas is probably going to have some changeover in their leadership, and they're going to have a different kind of battle. But then you've got states like Colorado, Massachusetts, New York, um, you know, any yeah. really any other New England, most New England states, California. You know, then you've got California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada. It's going yeah. to be a very different kind of issue yeah I, I think that I, I even think there's going to be differences between let's say a Colorado and a California in this regard you mentioned Colorado's libertarian leaning you know I think pro-lifers will have greater success in a place like Colorado for things like conscience protection for for physicians or uh, less draconian regulations on crisis pregnancy centers simply because of the libertarian mm -hmm. intuitions that people have, right? I mean, it's, uh, what I mean by that is that, you know, libertarians who may be, let's say, pro-abortion, they also would be inclined to protect physicians who don't want to participate in abortions because they hold a very strong view of, of personal liberty, and they would also extend that to, to physicians. Right. On the other hand, people that tend to be more kind of progressive left of center, they, th they see abortion as quote unquote health care. And this is why they don't, they, they've actually, if, if you've been paying care, I just noticed this was actually brought to my attention about a, a month ago, I was at a conference and a, another pro-life professor told me, she, she said, have you ever noticed you don't hear the word pro-choice anymore? Hmm. It's, it's now uh, access to abortion. And I go, I've I hadn't mm. noticed it. She said the reason for that is that if you use, if they use the language of pro-choice, that means that choice would also extend to people that don't want to cooperate with it, mm. like the physician or the nurse, and so they want to they don't they want them to be coerced to cooperate because they believe that this is a good. Yes. So I think that we have to be. I think in certain places like Colorado, it's going to be conscious protection will probably be, um, you know have a greater chance of being protected. I would even say places like Massachusetts and maybe even, uh, you know, maybe Connecticut, just because there's this older kind of religious culture, you know, a lot of Catholics live there. So there's, so there's a, so to give an Congregationalists, example, mm, that's right. Yeah, so Massachusetts yeah. actually the, the year, I think that Colorado passed a, um, a, uh, I think it was 2012 or, or maybe in 2016, there was something on the ballot for a uh, right to physician assisted suicide. Massachusetts didn't vote for it. And you think, well, Massachusetts is really liberal. What happened? Well, it's because they still have a lot of that residual religious culture there. Yeah. Um, so at least that's my theory on it. Okay. Uh, but things change. Uh, but I do think you're going to have di as you, you know, different fights in different states. And um, I think in, in certain states like California and New York, I think the battle's really going to be over whether Christian institutions or even non-Christian institutions that, let's say, share pro-life values, are, are they going to be coerced by the state to cooperate? Whether pro-life physicians and nurses and other healthcare personnel, are they going to be uh, given the liberty to say, no, I won't cooperate. That's, I think, going to be the battle in those places. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
in a place like Colorado, we could start with something like conscience, protecting the conscience. Yes. Uh, objections based on conscience. And then move from there to, you know, abortion facility regulations. Uh, maybe I, I'm just trying to think yes. of what the path is toward having a more pro-life view in a state where you're not likely to get an actual limit on the number yeah. of weeks in utero where abortions. I, I, I think that that's right. I, I do think the matter now is protecting our institutions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, private schools, uh, hospitals, healthcare facilities, physicians yeah. and nurses, and then uh, crisis pregnancy centers. Uh, we saw this attempt, uh, I think a year or two ago in California, uh, the California legislature signed by the governor that basically would have hamstrung crisis pregnancy centers from uh, speaking uh, their views. In fact, I think it was a requirement that CPCs actually had to refer I remember this People case. To, and I, yeah, it was from uh, California, yeah. right? Yes, I remember the I remember the case. So, was, but the Supreme Court ruled on that. That's right, and they ruled so, in favor of the CPCs uh, yes. as, co as a form of coerced speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's actual that's actually a legitimate, yeah, way to to approach the issue as well. Yeah. Did you ever think this is going to happen in, in your lifetime? That no, reviewing, uh, I was. Uh, I mean, I there was a part of me that hoped. And I would have, I, I would have never, I mean, there, I remember when Dobbs was decided, I mean, I remember the, where I was. So uh, I was actually in the Dallas airport uh, waiting to board I was, my flight to Waco. I had just given a couple of talks in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I was sitting next to a, uh, a professor from Cal Baptist who was at the same conference, an economist. And... We were sitting there and we saw up on the screen, mm. Roe v. Wade is overturned. And he texted his daughter who had read my book, Defending Life. And he said, Roe v. Wade is overturned. And I'm sitting next to the guy who wrote that book that you read about. And so I was like, I actually was choked up yeah. about it. It was, yeah. it was moving. But the thing that I turned to him and I said, I said, Andy, do you realize that Roe v. Wade began here in Dallas? It was a case involving uh, a woman, Norma McCorvey, yeah. uh, in Texas, and the attorney that was representing the state was a gentleman named Wade, who was the district attorney of Dallas, who would have prosecuted Lee Harvey Oswald if he had mm. lived. Mm. So, I mean, it was interesting to be actually in mm. the place where it began and to hear the news there. Uh, I think... It's going to be interesting, Jeff, in terms of how it's going to change the way we talk about this, because the other side on this has never really had to defend itself mm -hmm. in public in a way that meets the pro-life arguments head on. So we're going to see in legislatures all over the country debates, uh, assemblymen, senators, attorney generals governors actually making a case in public and it's going to have to be recorded and it'll be on YouTube. And I, I think that we, 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 I don't know where it's going to lead to, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think we have the better arguments. I think we have the, the right case. I think we have the, the correct moral position. Uh, is the country ready to accept that? Yeah. And that's so, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, this is uncharted territory. Yeah. Help somebody who's watching or listening right now, and I know a lot of people like to listen to the show when they're riding around in the car, or so I wanna give some hooks to hang on, hang on to. So let's say somebody's out for a walk right now, and they actually have a friend who says, oh, this is, this is about access to healthcare. That's what it is. That's the core issue. So they say they say that over lunch, and you've got just a few minutes to sort of give them a different perspective. What do you say? Yeah, well, that's it. That, 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 I'll, I'll tell you that how I've responded to, to that in my own conversations. Uh, are you saying that pregnancy is a disease? Hmm. Because to say that abortion is health care is to say that pregnancy is an illness. Now, hmm. it's not to say that people don't get ill when they're pregnant. It's, but that doesn't mean 
that pregnancy itself is the illness. Imagine when a woman finds out she's pregnant. Does she have the same response that she has when she finds out she has cancer or 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 COVID-19? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. She sometimes is troubled by it, right? It's un- maybe unexpected. She may have joy. I don't know of anyone who's ever gotten cancer who's been overjoyed. Yeah. So there's something about it. Yeah, look at my cancer test. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Posting it on so Facebook. Yeah. Uh, again, so I think that by, by raising it that way, it's to say that there's another party involved with this, and that's why we respond much differently to a pregnancy than we do to all sorts of other physical um, states that we can be in. Uh, and we, we clearly don't do that if, we, if we're diagnosed with a tumor or, or something, or we find out we have arthritis or <laughs> something right, like that. Right. We, uh, so, so there's something different about... Um, uh, uh, different about the question of abortion. And it also means, in a weird way, if in fact, if you want, if let's say someone bites the bullet and say, yes, pregnancy is a disease, that means that every single human being who's ever come into existence is an illness. Mm. I mean, that just is, it, it's an astonishing claim, right? That none of us is entitled to be alive. Mm. That the only reason why we're alive is that somebody willed us that there's not that we're not gifts to be received but objects under the total will of another mm. and i just that that i think is dehumanizing yeah uh, that's not to say again that people don't struggle over this that there aren't difficult pregnancies and not suggesting that at all but i think that we that we have to look at pregnancy as it really is it's it's the bringing into existence or it's the existence, a being has been brought into existence that is radically dependent on us. Mm-hmm. And that radical dependency doesn't end after birth. Right. right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, and it, I mean, there's something about I mean, parenthood that just is different from other relationships. Right. So, I mean, think about the ways in which we actually use parenthood to describe other relationships. We, uh, we use analogies, right? We say... You know, he treats him like a father treats a son, mm. right? Mm. She mothers her, right? Mm-hmm. Even if it's not the mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? So, so I mean, it's, it's part of the infrastructure of our lives to think of that, that relationship of dependency. Uh, so, to sort of, so if someone raises that, I, that's how I would respond. I would say, well, you're saying that pregnancy is a disease? Mm. Mm. I think most people would say no. Now, it's not to say that there aren't diseases or ailments that accompany that, but that pregnancy in and of itself doesn't seem to be. Right. Yeah. That. Yeah. I, that's a that's a fantastic point. Um, I think most people that I've talked to about this have engaged on the merits of the argument. But I, I've been surprised. I was surprised. Stephanie and I had a conversation with a guy who said, basically, here's what it comes down to. I was raised by a single mom. I basically raised myself. She didn't care for me. And everything would have been better off if I had just been aborted. Yeah. And I, th- I thought, okay, I can understand why he would have no respect for the life of an unborn child. He doesn't have respect for his own life. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, that changed the nature of our conversation to trying to, you know, yeah. address the value of his life. But, but the question then is that, don't you think that people can be mistaken about their own lives? Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the guy that's standing on Golden Gate Bridge about to jump, mm. his view of his life is that it's worthless. And we don't, do we really want to tell people that that's an appropriate way to think about mm. something like that? I mean, we can be mistaken about ourselves, right? I mean, there, we do have this view in our general culture that people's sort of subjective judgment of their own selves ought not to be challenged, but to me, that's actually false, right? Mm, yeah. I mean, people can be mistaken. I take it from a, a fellow human being. Mm-hmm. I've been mistaken <laughs> about, you know, the, the, my, I've had exaggerated views of myself and a, you know, uh, diminished views of myself, right? We all yeah. go through that. That's part of the struggle of being a human being. But we all recognize the intrinsic goodness of life. In fact, even this ge- the gentleman you just mentioned, I mean, in a sense, he's saying that, you know, his life would have been better if circumstances had been different, right? But doesn't that tell you that 
there's something actually worthy about it to mm. begin with. Mm. Mm. So I, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, people will, will, will oftentimes appeal to their own subjectivity, but sometimes we're just mistaken about ourselves. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is really good. So I've got a practical question for you because we have a couple of minutes left. You've got students coming back to Baylor this fall. Hmm. The Dobbs case was decided yeah. during the summertime. What are the discussions going to be on your campus and in your classes, do you think? Interesting question. I am the faculty advisor for ba Bears for Life, and I one of the things I'm going to actually recommend or suggest to, to the students in, in the group that maybe we should have a, like a public event about it. Mm -hmm. uh, in my own classes, I'm actually teaching um, a graduate seminar, religion, law, and politics, and then an undergraduate class called philosophy of law. Uh, I, I'm going to probably include something about it in um, philosophy of law. Mm -hmm. I haven't put together my, my syllabus yep. yet. I usually yep. don't in that class. I have another class called philosophy and the constitution where we actually spend three weeks on abortion. But given the unique circumstances, uh, I think I'm going to maybe include a little bit uh, about that. I have a section in the class about constitutional interpretation, so I'll probably find a place there. The graduate seminar, uh, Maybe I haven't I haven't quite decided yet. Yeah. Uh, although I've had a couple of my of my grad students kind of egging me on to to maybe uh, include something. Mm -hmm. But definitely in in the spring when I teach contemporary moral problems, uh, we will have a probably two to three weeks just on 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 abortion. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to force it into the syllabus just because it's a current issue, but at the same time, it's really really important for people to read Judge Alito's words and also to read the dissenting uh, views uh, because they're quite strident it is it's it's an amazing uh dissent uh and we could obviously talk mm -hmm. talk about that i'm actually thinking about working on a, an academic article on the dissent mm -hmm. uh, i was invited to contribute to a special issue on dobbs uh, of the journal, the new bioethics, and they they asked me what what do you want to write on, and I'm thinking about doing it on on that because I, yeah. I I suspect there aren't going to be a lot of people writing a lot about the dissent, and I think it's worth dealing with because the rhetoric in it is much different than Roe v. Wade majority opinion. You see the real cultural shift in the way in which uh, Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor uh, go after mm -hmm. uh, Justice Alito and defend the right to abortion. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, this is one of the most consequential things to happen during our lifetime. Something I never imagined would actually take place. I, like you, I had hoped, but I wasn't really optimistic yeah. that it could actually take place. And here you have people who trained as attorneys to be focused on being textualists, originalists, you know, their particular focus on the Constitution, work their way up through their careers, get to the place where they could be appointed to the United States Supreme Court. Uh, every one of those steps along the way could have resulted in an opposite sort of, you know, Samuel Alito could have retired as an appellate judge and never been heard yeah. from again. But we have to be prepared, I think. And, you know, I think as men of faith, we have to think this way. Perhaps God will use me mm. and i have to live every day in the belief that he will and then let him determine the outcomes yeah i mean i think you have to be open to where the lord is is, yeah. is leading you uh and you know there are going to be conversations in churches and family gatherings and i think you know the one thing as pro-lifers and it's not fair what i'm going to say to that we, we we have a, I think, an, um, a reputation of being harsh and overly critical, which I think is mm. not not true. I, most people that I know that work in the pro life movement are amazingly careful, caring, good people. But you know, the media right. gives a certain portrayal of us. So I think we have to, you know, be careful with our words, uh, be kind to people when people are angry at us. 
you know, that could be somebody that may have had an abortion in their, and, and, and they're, they're, they're wrestling with internal guilt. They could be a, a man that, who maybe encouraged his wife or girlfriend to have an abortion. Mm-hmm. You, you don't, so we, we have to remember that, there, that sometimes the anger against us isn't always, in fact, I think it's virtually never a sort of intellectual thing. I think it's, it's emotional. So we have, to, we have to be, you know, I think compassionate to people. Yeah. Yeah. Frank, uh, this has been a really amazing discussion. Thanks for taking time to be on the show today. Thanks for having me. Thank you to my guest today, Dr. Frank Beckwith, for joining on the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. So you can find out more about Dr. Beckwith's work in philosophy, law, politics, abortion, and more through his website, which is francisbeckwith.com. The prophet Jeremiah said to the people, stand at the crossroads and look, ask for the ancient paths, ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. This conversation today with Frank has demonstrated that when we go back to God's truth and we learn to articulate it in a way that makes sense to our society, we can not only advance truth, we can also help reach the minds and hearts of our friends and neighbors. See you next week. Hey, it's Dr. Jeff from the Dr. Jeff Show podcast. I'm excited to be releasing a new book. This is the book I wrote during my cancer journey called Truth Changes Everything. It's the book that I thought, if this is the last thing you ever get to write, this is what I want to write about. I want to write about truth. I think at the core of all of the cultural conflicts we have today is a battle over truth. I mean a battle between the idea of capital T truth, that truth actually exists and can be discovered, and the idea of small t truth, that ultimate truth cannot be known, truth is up to the individual. One side says, seek the truth. The other side says, speak your truth. Have you faced this in your own life? The question, as I wrote the book, is, all right, so what do you do? There's really a battle. You can really see the truth exists. But what's the most helpful thing? So I went back into history, and I just wrote the book telling stories of amazing people who were Jesus followers, who believed that Jesus is the truth. And as a result of that belief, they changed the world, even in times of great crisis, when it seemed that the world is going to come to an end. If that sounds like the kind of book you'd like to read, I'd love for you to pre-order a copy wherever you get your books. And if you will take a picture of your receipt and send it to me at jeff at summit.org, then I'm going to send you a little signed book plate. And then you can stick that inside your book when it arrives. You'll have a signed copy of the book. So the book is Truth Changes Everything. And my email is jeff at summit.org. Pre-order it, please. And then just send me the receipt and we'll take it from there. Listeners, I want you to know that our podcast is on Edify, which is a truly powerful app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. You can download it at edify, E-D-I-F-I dot app. Be sure to share this show if you have enjoyed listening to it. And leave a review, if you would, on the site where you download the show. That helps more people know about The Dr. Jeff Show. And I'll look forward to seeing you next week. 